All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today. Our second webinar here, uh, Selena USA. Like I said, this is going to be a good year. We got a lot of big changes coming, and uh, a lot of information that we'll be passing out to um, anybody and everybody that loves to watch our content. Today, we're going to be reviewing six building codes you didn't know. Um, and so, I got. Samuel here with me, uh, and so if he wants to chime in at some point, he might do so. I might ask a question here, and um, really, we'll just kind of jump right into it. First, we're going to look at the agenda. We have um, <clears throat> where these six building codes uh, you didn't know come into place. Well, one is going to be all around your house. Another is going to be around your windows and doors. There will be another that's uh, just talking about getting too much fr fresh air. Uh, and then how about behind your drywall and under your feet? So we'll kind of review these. We'll, we'll see the six codes at the end and then uh, where you can find us here coming up. So first, let's talk about all around your house. How are, oh, sorry, I'm about to sneeze. How are fire safety and draft air connected? So when I think about all around the house, um, one of the first things I always think about a house, house is made of wood and wood is highly flammable. Well, uh, in the United States, at least all of our main framing of residential is wood frame. And so fire safety is uh, very big. And in that um, fire, well, it's fueled by oxygen and uh, oxygen being the main corporate to let the fire continue to increase and burn the wood uh, would be something that maybe, I don't know, you want to kind of check out and see what you can do about. And so one of the things is, um, you know, to uh, kind of mitigate or reduce fueling of the fire, um, you would need some kind of material to do that. Maybe something that kind of uh, blocks the air, reduces the flow, something along this 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 kind of line. And, and in order to block or reduce the flow, you kind of got to, you have to be airtight in a sense, right? You have to be able to go to any shape or form um, of this of this gap or void. You'll have to kind of be able to fill it in almost like water fills in a cup. Uh, but you're going to have to do it in free space where it's kind of just maybe up against two different boards and maybe in between a, a hole in a cavity of the wall. So I'm, I'm just kind of thinking all around your house, there's opportunities for more oxygen to come in and fuel this fire. Well, luckily, there is one way um, to kind of fill those weird shaped oblong kind of voids and gaps, and that's with one component spray foam. Um, one component spray foam is actually a kind of a standard building practice today, and that's kind of due to its ability to fill those cavities and random areas that are going to allow draft air and just any kind of air throughout your house circulate a little bit more. You know, you see, you see spray foam in all sorts of areas in, in new residential builds if you walk through new neighborhoods. So what what exactly, um, as an example, can you use any type of foam insulation, though, for this job? You know, if we're talking about fire safety and the draft air that's fueling this fire, can I use any kind of foam? Can I just use two component spray foam that you insulate your house with? Do you have to have special rated foam? Does it have to be certified? You know, what are these, how do you find the answer to this? Well, first we're gonna go and look at the IRC, which is the International Residential Building Code. And in there, it has some pretty clear instructions as far as what to do with uh, the surface kind of um, burning characteristics of these foams that you'll be putting in your house to kind of block that draft that draft air and what's really big uh, if you notice i kind of highlighted here is the flame spread can't be more than 75 and smoke development can't be more than 450 and it kind of states a little bit later in astm e84 and the ul 723 so this is your first code 
any spray foam you put in your house, um, especially for this fire resistant part of the construction, basically blocking that draft air and, and it's part of that fire system, fire resistant system. This can need to be UL723 listed um, or an equivalent test is the ASTM E84. Those have the flame spread and smoke development listed for the product. Now, in addition to that, there's actually um, another code that's unique specifically for foam plastics like insulation foam, and that would be the NFPA 286. Now, that's, that kind of goes in junction with the UL723 or the ASTM E84, so you can't have one um, or the other, meaning you can't have UL723 or NF. PA-286, they kind of go hand in hand for uh, these insulation foams. And there's really a few other things that have kind of come about. Um, there's not necessarily always it per region. It can kind of uh, vary. So always check your local building codes. But per region, they've started to come more accustomed to having an orange dye for ease of ins inspection. They'll definitely check to make sure the product is either ASTM E84 or UL723 tested and listed. If there's that special approval needed via the NFPA 286, there's going to be, it's going to need to have that on, on the uh, product information. And lastly, for multifamilies, the, you know, bigger um, residential type bills, they're going to need that ICCES report. Now, that's not part of this IRC building code, per se, I was looking at, just kind of a little extra information there. But luckily, we here at Selena USA, we have a product, um, actually two products, that meet these codes. And that would be the Titan Fire Block Extreme and Titan Fire Block 113. Both of them meet the UL723. Uh, they have been tested and they are listed by UL. They also have been tested to the NFEA 286, and they're also listed um, with an ESR report for the ICC-ES. So these can be used in multifamilies or uh, single family slash two family dwelling uh, residential building. So those are the first two codes you might not have known about. Um, and next, you know, I was thinking we had all around your house. Next, I was thinking, okay, well, to get into the house, you got to go either through a door or a window. You're not necessarily going through a wall unless you're the Hulk, and I am not that. So going through doors or windows, would you be able to insulate around your doors and windows using a fire block foam? You know, do you want to use the same thing? Really, the answer is no. Um, and the reason for this is, one, you don't want to have orange dye on a white window frame. Uh, dye does exactly what it's made to do, which is dye a color that whatever that dye color is. So if you have a white window frame and you put orange foam and you accidentally get a little crazy and there's some on your window seal, well, now your window seal is orange. And I can guarantee you that's not going to make a homeowner not uh, happy. <laughs> So that's one reason. Another reason is, well, fire block foam, I kind of mentioned it uh, in that first slide, but fire block foam is made to fill all sorts of random cavities. They're going to be big, oblong shaped and all sorts of things. So you don't necessarily need a foam that's made to fill large gaps and kind of oblong areas. Uh, so, you know, maybe what should you use to fill if, if, if it's not the fire block foam? Do you need to use fiberglass? Do you need to use like a caulk sealant? Maybe a different kind of spray foam? So let's take a look, see what are some advantages or disadvantages of these and kind of work our way through it. But first, let's look over at the IRC again. And uh, in there, let's see, what in the heck does the IRC have to do? You know, what are they, what are they saying about around your windows and doors? You know, what do you need to use? To kind of seal that well the irc is actually only stating that the space between the frame of that window and door jam to the framing of your house their statement is that it shall be sealed i don't know about you but for me that leaves a lot of gray area shall be sealed what else does that mean how much more can it get into well 
Let's go back. Let's go back to the question of, well, what should we use for this filling? Fiberglass, caulk, spray foam. And kind of ask our swell self again, is just sealing enough? So the IRC says shall be sealed. Is just sealing enough? You know, what about water? What about keeping your house insulated? Other things. Does sealing imply that? You know, I'm I can't foresee what, what it is implies or not. And I'm just reading it word for word. Shall be sealed. So say we're going to use fiberglass to seal. You know, we're going to seal with fiberglass. Well, fiberglass, it may have some insulation properties. You know, that might be nice, but it allows water. And water on wood is pretty bad. It can cause some black mold, some mildew, fungi in those cavities. So in between your doors, your windows, and the framing of your house, if you have fiberglass and water gets in there, now you have the ability for mold, mildew, and fungi to grow. So maybe we don't want to use fiberglass. Maybe let's look at, okay, caulk. Caulk, will, that'll seal up the, the entrance, right? Caulk, it seals up to prevent any kind of water in, so that's nice, but unfortunately, caulk doesn't have much insulation value. It's little to none, and the bad part about caulking is it will start to shrink and crack over time, especially after consistent um, exposure to the element. So maybe not the best, but I don't know. Is there maybe a spray foam we can use? Well, spray foam, actually, you know, kind of like we were saying with the fire block, it, it's nice because it can insulate. So it'll kind of block any kind of draft air. And it's even better because it uh, will prevent water penetration. So if you can prevent the water penetration around the framing in your house from the windows and doors, and it insulates, that kind of seems like a win-win. So could you just use any kind of spray foam? And, you know, would any of those, would any foam, would, would kind of no fire block wouldn't per se because of the orange dye. So now we start looking to the uh, air leakage and when you're reading later on in this section of uh, sealing your house, it, it actually brings up a really good um, company and uh, kind of leads into a certification that I think a lot of window and door sealers should have, which is AAMA, uh, now part of FGIA. But AAMA um, specifically talking about the Fenestration of air leakage in windows. Well, a window is part of a unit, which is part of a house. And the house is connected to this window unit. And so you would think any product that connects your house to this window unit, you would want kind of in similarity to um, the requirements and or the procedures the windows being tested under. And so part of that is, well, what exactly um, can we do to get a spray foam <coughs> in the AAMA? Well, AM, AAMA actually has a uh, test where it, it is specified to see if a spray foam is going to be low expansion, minimal expansion, so it doesn't bow or bend windows and doors framings. It's also checking to make sure how stable it is and a few other things, but really what's important is not bowing or bending those windows or door frames. And so really what we want, if we are going to use a spray foam because it has the insulation, it has the water prevention, then we want something that's going to be low expansion formula, which is going to be a, an AAMA verified component. Uh, luckily, Titan Professional, we have two of those. We have a window and door insulating foam sealant, uh, which is UL certified as well as AAMA and the extreme temp, which is a broader um, extreme temp, meaning a broader application temperature range for application uh, reasoning. And so it has a broader temperature range it can be applied at. And this is also AAMA and UL listed. So these are two products where you could seal but actually do more than just sealing around your windows and doors. You can seal and insulate. So this is the second building code, or third, I'm, apologies, the third building code to kind of refer back to. Just shall be sealed. Now next, 
a lot of people love fresh air. You walk out of your house, you're like, ah, oh, fresh air. You know, you go out into the countryside, ah, oh, fresh air, right? But is there a thing uh, that could be, is there such a thing of too much fresh air for your house? You know, and uh, what exactly does that mean? How could you have too much fresh air? Well, fresh air for a house can be good and bad. A lot of fresh air means it's not very insulated. It's not very sealed. It's not sealed too well. Um, but you do need some fresh air because if it was perfectly sealed, it'd be like a vacuum and you wouldn't be able to open or close your windows or doors. So you do need some amount of fresh air, but how do you know if you have too much fresh air? Well, there's this thing called the blower door test. And uh, what is a blower door and what is it testing? So let's look at that. What is a blower door? You know, what is it testing and why do we want to do this? You know, kind of answered. You don't want to, you don't want to have too much fresh air. That means your house is going to get uh, very cold in the winter, very hot. In the winter. No fresh air because then you can't open your doors and windows. So we kind of answer that one. But let's look at what is a blower door, and what is it testing? Well, blower door, uh, you can see in this example, is quite literally a tarp that goes on your door, and it's pulling air from outside and pushing it back outside. So it's trying to pull air from the cavities in your house and, and see where it's penetrating in your house and then pushing it back outside. And, and what this blower door tests, you know, this, this machine is really testing the leakage. So how much air leakage is there that's penetrating into your house? And so from here, um, this blower door test, it's measuring in air changes per hour, or ACH. And so this ACH will tell you, uh, do you have too much fresh air? You know, and what there is, there's actually a rating. The higher the ACH, the worse off it is. The lower the ACH, the better sealed your house is. Now, again, you don't want a perfectly sealed house that's completely immune to any amount of fresh air because it'll be like a vacuum. But you do need some amount of fresh air and you don't want too much. So how do you kind of figure that out? Um, well, there's actually building codes that'll tell you how much fresh air there is or not in your house according to the climate that you're in. So if we look at the uh, climate map based off of the IRC book, then we'll kind of see, okay, so we're here in Texas, we're in North Texas, we're kind of this orange-ish area, and this orange-ish area is in climate three, so it says warm, humid, 3A is warm and humid, and I can attest we do often get warm and humid. Um, now, looking at it, uh, you're like, okay, so what exactly does this test do for me? Well, I mean, what exactly does this map do for me? Well, it doesn't do anything unless you have the key code, so to speak. And so I'll pull up this key code. The key code is actually going to tell us what climates need what kind of air change per hour, or ACH, uh, based off of the blower door test. So if we look at climate zones 0 through 2, which are going to be Basically, all the climates in the northern region of the United States, anything that's extremely cold and, and somewhat dry or cold and, and, and humid, things like this, climates zero through two, they get, a, oh, sorry about that. Uh, I was misreading my own uh, map here. <laughs> Climate zone zero through two are at the bottom, uh, apologies or towards the bottom of the United States map. And those are gonna be your warmer areas. So with warmer areas, you get a five ACH uh, rating is what your, your new build would need to pass. And then for climate zones three through eight, we'll get three air exchanges per hour as the ACH rating that they need to pass. So you can see as you go farther north, you're gonna have a tighter ACH. Um, so that way you can keep heat in in the winters and those really long uh, Minnesota winters that happen for six months out of the year, you're going to need to be able to keep the heat in so you can quite literally keep the frost out. And um, down here in the south, maybe towards Texas area, it doesn't get quite as cold for quite as long. So
So maybe a little more air exchange per hour is, is, is something that's acceptable. And so really towards the bottom of the map, if you just kind of look in that orange, red kind of area, that's going to be the five air exchanges. And towards the top, that green, blue, and purple, uh, those are going to be more of the three air exchanges. And like I said, the lower the number, the better sealed your house is. Now, if we kind of look at, you know, how does this play into a factor of Selena USA? And, well, I kind of want to tell you something. I was looking through some market research, and um, there's actually a significant amount of air leakage that's behind your air wall, uh, drywall. And this is a uh, quote from some research done, but drywall to top plates are one of the biggest joints accounting for around 1.3 to 1.6 ACH. And the 50 refers to the test. So 1.3 to 1.6 ACH. Now, if you can only have uh, three air exchanges per hour in the north, 1.3 or 1.6, that means half of it. You, you can cut right? You can cut it in half, so to speak, um, if you were at three air exchanges per hour. But say you were at five or say you were at four and you needed to get down to that three, well, now you know you could seal up the top plates uh, to the drywall, the drywall and the top plates. If you seal those up, you could essentially go from four to below three, which is great news. Now, how exactly could you do that? Selena USA has a product called Titan Professional Gasket Foam, which is specifically designed to seal behind the drywall, the top plates and the bottom plates. So we want to go, we want to go ahead and seal the bottom plates to stop any air infiltration from underneath your subfloor or um, anything like this, but also you want to seal those top plates so any air attic, um, attic air coming in can kind of be prevented and uh, slowed down and or completely stopped. And one way to do that is with our Titan Professional Gasket Foam. This gasket foam is very unique uh, versus many other products because it works quite literally like a gasket. It is very squishy to touch when it's fully cured and that's the nice part about that is that it is uh, can be compressed against the drywall and whenever the drywall is moved uh, because of the framing and the housing are moved, that gasket foam can actually fill up the gap or void um, if there's any movement. So the gasket foam is one way to lower your ACH potentially up to 1.6. Now, if we want to keep thinking about another building code uh, that you might not know, I like to look behind the drywall. Now, why do we use drywall? You know, I was just talking about between the drywall and the top plate, and then you start thinking a lot of residential, and almost the majority of residential is using drywall. You know, why wouldn't we use OSB or plywood? Why wouldn't we use metal sheets? You know, why are we using drywall? Well, first, let's look at some of the properties maybe of drywall. Well, gypsum, among many things, it's cheap. And so for when you're building a, a very large house and you want to build it quickly and you want to do it expen inexpensively as possible and have the highest return, you use a little bit cheaper material sometimes, potentially, not always. And in this, um, drywall is also very easy to install, repair, replace, uh, but it also can reduce some sound transmission. Now, another thing that you might want to know about drywall um, is that it has a really good advantage over wood. And what exactly am I talking about? I'm talking about some fire resistance. Uh, wood, like plywood and OSB, being pretty flammable. Drywall, on the other hand, is not extremely flammable. Um, and that's just due to the material that it's made out of. So, you know, wouldn't you want your house to be more fire resistant? We talked about fire blocking the first time. Hey, James. Around your house. Yeah. Hey, we got a good question on chat about the uh, gasket foam. Okay. How many days before the drywall is hung 
can your gasket foam be applied? Oh man, that's a good question. So gasket foam uh, needs 24 hours to fully cure. It's usually applied by the insulation crew. So the same crew that's using the Titan Professional window and door foam and the Titan Professional fire block foam, they will are they are typically the same crew that's using the gasket foam or um, something of that nature. And so typically after you have the insulation crew, they come in, they spray the fire block, the window and door, the gasket, an inspector has to come in and check uh, to make sure everything's been fire blocked to code, sealed around the windows and doors. And usually an inspector isn't out there the same day as the insulation crew. It's usually the day after or something like this. So typically your, uh, your gasket your gasket foam has time to fully cure, but you need at least 24 hours before you install the drywall. Other than that, uh, gasket foam could be put up a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks before the drywall. Uh, really, though, it, it usually is with the insulation crew. And once the insulation crew is done with their job, um, that's whenever drywallers come in. So it typically works out because there's an inspector in between the two crews uh, and so there's not much worry about the 24 hours but uh, as far as how far in advance i mean in theory i guess as far advanced as you'd want uh, just be prepared to have it sitting on your top plates and bottom plates uh, but otherwise yeah it typically is installed with the insulation crew um, and that's usually done well before 24 hours of the drywall crew. So minimum of at least 24 hours. Other than that, it could be, I guess, in theory, a little bit longer or as long as you need. Okay, so the next, the next question is, how big of a gap is the gasket foam effective? Oh, that's another good question. So gasket foam, let me just go ahead and go back, actually, since we're talking about gasket foam. Gasket foam is, um, is a product that's made to seal after it's fully cured. So it really comes down to how big of a bead you're applying to that top or bottom plate. Okay, all of these, all of these products that we're showcasing today um, through these building codes are used in junction with a gun applicator. And these gun applicators have dials on the back where you can adjust the bead size. We actually have uh, YouTube videos on this, which I'll get into a little bit later. And uh, you can adjust the bead size of this gasket foam. So you could have it a quarter inch, um, or you could have it a half inch. You could have it up to an inch and a half. Uh, so the gasket foam in theory will go to a just about um, two inches in bead size after fully cured. If you opened up the control knob all the way and pull the trigger as far back as possible, after it's fully cured, it'd be about two inches just under. Um, so in theory, from the top plate to the drywall, it could seal a gap that's about two inches. It's, it's a little less, but pretty, pretty close to that. Are there any other questions about gaseous foam, Samuel, while we're on here? No, I think I think that's it. Yeah, I think thank you, James. Okay. Okay. Yeah, in in one other comment about um, how much the gasket foam can kind of gasket foam can kind of seal. It's always good to kind of review back our TDSs. Um, our technical data sheets will kind of specify how to apply and what to look for. Um, and then there's always our YouTube videos. We, we do a good job of trying to explain things, um, I think. And, and so uh, those two bases should cover most of, of some of the questions. Um, but uh, I, do, I do think going back and reviewing the YouTube video on how to control the bead size would be good and why different bead sizes are used for different products. Because the gasket foam, um, yeah, you wouldn't necessarily want only a quarter inch because there's more than a quarter inch of moving in your house, like the framing of your house. And so if there's up to a half inch moving, that's what you kind of want to go with. But um, yeah, it, look, look over at our TDSs, which are on our titan.com forward slash US web page. And uh, hopefully that'll answer your questions. If not, I'm always available to answer them in person. So I'll jump back over to behind your drywall. 
We're talking about gypsum and how it's better than wood or OSB because it's got some fire resistance. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I'm thinking, wow, you know, wouldn't I want my house to be the best as it can be against fire resisting fires um, in the spread of fires? Well, yeah, you know, that's part of why we use fire block foam to stop that draft air from fueling a fire. So this is also a reason why we kind of use drywall or gypsum, and that's because of its fire resistance versus just using plain OSB or, or plywood. And so looking at it, um, gypsum, it's up on a wall, okay? It's on these studs. And the longer you can keep it up on these studs, the, the longer it would resist fire from going into the next room, per se, okay? So you have this gypsum, it's up on the wall or it's on your ceiling, and you want to keep it there as long as possible in case there's a fire in bedroom A. And you don't want it to get to bedroom B. So if you have your house has been fire blocked, it's been gypsum boarded up, and you know you're living in it, you happen to get a fire in, in bedroom A, you would want your drywall to stay up as long as possible because it's going to keep the studs behind that drywall from catching fire because those studs, well, they're made of wood. Wood burns very quickly and very easily and very hot. So how can you make sure this drywall stays up as long as possible? Well, if we look at um, the IRC again, the IRC actually talks about a adhesive and it says this adhesive when you're being whenever you're trying to keep the drywall up and to make sure it's secured to the studs this adhesive well it's it's got to be a to a specific code and that adhesive if it's a caulk adhesive would be ASTM C557 and for polyurethane foam adhesives like what Selena USA has it'd be ASTM D6464 so ASTM D6464 is specific to polyurethane foam adhesives. And I kind of want to talk about why, why using a glue would be important. Okay. So I want to do a little question of, Samuel, did you know? Samuel, I want to ask you, how much, just give it a wild guess, how much square footage of drywall do you think is in the average 2,000 square foot house? Just throw a number out there. 2,000 square feet. It's on the walls. It's on the ceiling. I would say maybe 5,000 feet, 5,000 square feet. Okay, not bad. I was pretty close. It's actually close to about 8,000 to 9,000. Oh, wow. About 150 to 160 wow. drywall sheets. Um, and each sheet, if you're using no adhesive, is going to require approximately, you know, about 28 screws. But if you're using the drywall with an adhesive, you only use 21 screws. Well, why does why did I just throw screws into the matter, right? I thought we were talking about drywall and keeping it up with adhesive. Well, you have to use fasteners. That's part of the building code. So you have to have fasteners. The adhesive is the optional part. And so immediately we can kind of see, well, we have to use fasteners. If I don't use glue, I got to use 28 per sheet. If I do use glue, I get to use 21. So I save seven screws a sheet. There's 150. Wow, that must add up pretty quick. So let's look at the spacing though too, how that kind of, why, why is there 28 screws for one and 21 screws for the other? Well, if you're using this drywall with fasteners only, uh, the spacing is where the difference is. So the spacing between a drywall that has an adhesive behind it versus a drywall that does not have an adhesive behind it is where the screw count will change. Adhesive behind the drywall means you can have further spacing between each screw because you have an, a bond between that gypsum in the stud of your, of your house. Now, kind of looking back, okay, so we have 28... Uh, fasteners without without a drywall adhesive, 21 with, you know, what does that math out to be if you have 150 drywall boards up? Uh, well, if you're not using an adhesive, that's over 4,000 screws. If you are using an adhesive, just over 3,000. So you save about 1,000 screws per house. 
again, why am I talking about screws so much? Well, screws, uh, they're in gypsum, which is kind of like chalky and can kind of break and move a little bit. It, you know, it's, it's not a solid, solid piece like wood. Wood is solid. Uh, gypsum has more of a chalk kind of feel and texture and build. Well, drywall, when you're not using an adhesive, drywall will, while it may move with the house, the fastener will not. So the fastener, it could pop out of the stud, it could, it could break up some of the drywall behind your paint, and then all of a sudden you might have some screw pops. And these screw pops can be a real pain. We actually saw a ABC News Nightly where there was a lady that went through her new build and found 800 screw pops. 800 and marked all 800 with blue tape. You imagine that? So for me, I'm thinking, one, I got to keep this drywall up because it's fire resistant. How's the best way to do it? It appears that having an adhesive plus fasteners is the best way because I'm going to say fasteners. But also the adhesive does another thing. This adhesive also will prevent screw pops. And if I can pre and if I can prevent these screw pops and having to get my drywall reworked after this new build's been put up, even better. I mean, you're having less fasteners you have to use, so less potential for screw pops. And this adhesive, it's actually designed to prevent screw pops. What adhesive am I talking about? I'm talking about the Titan Professional drywall adhesive. It's designed to prevent screw pops. And the reason it does that and how it does that is it will expand to fill any gap or void between the gypsum board and that stud. If the screw happens to miss the stud, that adhesive is taking care of its job. If the screw is in the stud but not deep enough, that adhesive is bonding the gypsum board to the stud, keeping your drywall on, keeping that screw from preventing it from popping out so you don't have to go back and do any rework. And it's also keeping the framing your house more structurally sound. You have your studs connected with your drywall, which are all taped and putty together. It's more structurally sound together as a full system. So behind your drywall, uh, this building code is talking about the spacing that uh, the screws can have with or without a drywall adhesive. And that drywall adhesive, what ASTM standard it might need, C557 or ASTM D6464. Yeah, we, we got another question on this one, James. So how does the number of screws needed change when using half inch or five eighths inch drywall? Okay, that's actually a good question. So I don't have the IRC pulled up um, with me, but if you go into the R IRC and you go into section R702, Point three, which is the gypsum board and gypsum panel kind of area. In there, they're going to have this fastening um, kind of chart. You can see that I had pulled a snippet, so to speak, of a 3 8 um, thickness. And I just did this as an example. So I did the 3 8 as an example. But there are a full list of gypsum board um thicknesses listed in that chart or in that panel. The IRC, by the way, is free to get to online. So you can search all these building codes for free. Um, and, and, it's, and it's a great way too to kind of educate yourself on what your house has in it or doesn't have in it. Uh, but yeah, in the IRC and specifically the R702.3 section, uh, which is going to have to do with the gypsum, and it's kind of like the framing of the, of the the walls of the interior walls of the house. That's going to have the different thicknesses of gypsum board being used. And in there, it'll tell you if it's on the ceiling and it's um, perpendicular or horizontal, this spacing is required. Or if it's on the ceiling, it can be either direction and this spacing is required. So it gets pretty detailed. Uh, again, I just kind of pulled this three eighths as an example. Um, and I don't have the IRC pulled up at the moment, but I would say that's where I would go to look for any question as far as how many fasteners, what spacing, specifically what spacing to use. The IRC is always best and always go to the most recent, the IRC 
2020-21. That kind of helped Samuel, you think? Yep. Okay. Yep. I put a link in the chat as well. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Awesome. So next, we've kind of talked about the ceilings, the walls, the doors, the windows, all around your house. One thing we haven't talked about is underneath your feet. Um, and underneath your feet, uh, if you're in two-story uh, here in Texas, or if you're in a um, one-story in the north that has a basement, underneath your feet is going to be a subfloor. So in Texas, this might not apply for the single families that have a one story. You're typically built on slab. So your framing of the house is built directly on the slab up. Uh, but in the north, if you have a one story, there's typically a basement underneath, uh, which means then you have joist or beam, I beams going to hold the subfloor up on that one story kind of house. And then, then in Texas, as another example, um, if you have a two-story house built on slab, again, the concrete base, but then the second story is what's on wood, uh, joist, or I-beams. So I'm specifically going to be talking about subfloor here. So what's what about under your feet? What, what do we have here? What holds your subfloor in place? Okay, the subfloor is this OSB or plywood panel that's quite literally laying on top of joist or I-beams. Joist or I-beams are running the span of your house from wall to wall, exterior wall to exterior wall. Sometimes they can be met with a column or beam in the middle of the house. Maybe that's why you have some beams or columns in the middle of your house for those that have two-story here in Texas. Um, and so you have this subfloor that you're essentially walking on. It's underneath your carpet upstairs or it's underneath your tile in the bathroom upstairs. There's this subfloor. It's OSB or plywood, something of this nature. This subfloor is resting on top of I-beams or joists. Now, what does the IRC say that needs to hold this subfloor in place? Um, unfortunately, for in my opinion, unfortunately, nails. Nails are the only required fastener to help lateral displacement and uplift. And that for me is very alarming. Uh, why, you know, why should we be frightening? I, I'm frightened by this. Why should you be frightened by this? Uh, nails alone are kind of like uh, it's like screeching nails on a chalkboard to me because I know what's about to come. Nails, they don't have imperfections, kind of like screws have threading. So these nails, they might be ribbed a little bit, uh, but these nails are it's a smooth shank for the most part. And what happens with wood? Well, we kind of covered in our this in our first webinar, but nails alone... They can come loose from subfloor and joists after repeated wear and tear. That loose nail now has a floor. That's what causes the floor squeak. And I don't know about you, but floor squeaks are extremely annoying. And some homeowners, new homeowners, even think floor squeak, they find a floor squeak to be an alarm because they think it's not structurally sound. So a floor squeak, although... For those that are builders, they may know that that doesn't mean that it's not structurally sound, that it's still going to be okay. The new homeowner, they might think, mm, my floor is going to fall out from beneath me. You know, it's squeaking. That means something's wrong. That's all the homeowner knows. And you know what? Rightfully so. So nails are alarming because they can come loose from wood. And did you know that floor squeaks are among the top reasons Samuel, was it number two whenever we talked about this in our first webinar? Yes. yes. Yeah, it was the second most. This is the second most reason for callbacks. The second most reason for callbacks are floor squeaks because it is something that is very serious. And we covered this a little bit in our first webinar. If you want to go back onto our YouTube page, you can kind of see where we reference APA how to construct a solid squeak-free squeak floor system. 
And um, in, in that webinar, we talk a little bit about what causes it, why does wood war, things like this. It would be great. It's a huge discussion all on its own. I don't have time for to, to cover all of that expansive today, although I would love to. Um, but I would suggest you go back, review that, and then come back to this webinar, and you'll kind of get everything that I'm about to go into even further. So these nails, they come loose because the wood could move, it can warp, it's not perfect. The wood is not perfect. It may be engineered, but it is not perfect. It still absorbs, contrasts, it expands, it does all sorts of things. So surely there must be a way to prevent floor squeaks. Surely there's a way to prevent this nail from coming loose underneath the subfloor or coming loose of the coming loose from the joist or the I-beam. Well, surely there is. And that is with our Titan Professional subfloor adhesive. So although the IRC is stating nails are what's required, only nails, just to keep it from moving laterally or any kind of uplift, I, I strongly suggest, and many home builders, many wise home builders use a subfloor adhesive to prevent floor squeaks. It is the second highest. It is the numbers. It is number two on callbacks for home builders for a good reason. So subfloor adhesive, although it's not in the IRC, only nails are, subfloor adhesive, I am saying, is very strongly suggested and is very commonly used with subfloors today. And that's because it can prevent floor squeaks. Now, our Titan Professional subfloor Adhesive is very unique because it expands. Unlike traditional caulk adhesive, you lay a bead down on the joist, you could squish it and it'll stay squished for the rest of our its life. The subfloor adhesive that Selena USA sells, this Titan Professional subfloor adhesive expands over 48 hours. So it'll bond that subfloor to the joist by filling any gap or void. Any imperfection in that wood has now been filled with an adhesive to permanently bond that subfloor to the joist or the I beam. And when you bond them, there's less, there's less strain on the fasteners. When there's less strain on the fasteners, you're preventing the floor from squeaking. And you're stopping your number two callback. So let's go back. Let's review the six building codes here briefly. First with fire block. We talked about it being UL723 listed and tested or the ASTM E84. There's also the special approval with the NFA, NFPA 286 for polyurethane adhesive. Now, the next part was, is sealing enough around your windows and doors? I say it's not. I say you need to have a window and door foam that's AAMA approved and tested and that would be sufficient, in my professional opinion, to actually seal and insulate around your windows and doors. Gasket foam with the blower door test, lowering that ACH potentially up to 1.6, which is huge around those top plates of the drywall. And second to last, drywall adhesive. You can reduce the amount of fasteners. When you reduce the amount of fasteners, you're reducing the possible amount of uh, possible screw pops. Um, but also you got to make sure it's been tested to ASTM D6464 for those polyurethane adhesives. And last but not least, in my professional opinion, nails are not enough. At some point, they will come loose. And at some point, there will be a floor squeak. So you're going to want to use a subfloor adhesive that has been tested to ASTM D3498, which is going to help you understand that the uh, floor squeaks, they can be prevented. And last, let's go ahead and say, where can you check us out? Samuel, Samuel do you want to talk about real quick where we'll be at Sunbelt? I know we just got some booth. booth sure. Yeah, yeah. So on that on that last slide, I would say the the biggest confusion that I see people doing is mm -hmm. using fire block where window and door should go and yes. using window and door where fire block should go. You know, to mm -hmm. like the untrained eye, 
those two foams might look the same, I, I suppose, as they come out of the gun, but they do not cure the same way. They do not perform the same way. They're, we, we make them with different chemicals on purpose, and they're different colors on purpose as well. They're, they shouldn't replace each other. I, I think that some, that's some of the biggest takeaways of this whole presentation, just because of how many places I see people using fire block around the windows. Like, stop. Your, your, your job isn't going to pass inspection. You yeah. know, I hate yeah. to see I, we James and I film a lot of videos. Um, if you look at our YouTube channel, we go to job sites all the time, filming videos every week, every other week or so. And I see it all the time. It just, it blows my mind. I feel, I always feel bad for the people, the whatever insulation crew did that. Um, so yeah. to come back and rework. Yeah. Yeah. I, f I feel bad for those guys, but, um, yeah, going to the next slide. The um, we are exhibiting at two trade shows this year: the Sunbelt Builder Show uh, in Fort Worth, Texas. That's where our headquarters office is, um, and then Stafta Show in Nashville. We'll we'll be there as well. If you want to come, if you want to come meet us in person, that James and I'll both be there um, at at these shows uh, exhibiting the Titan products. And then we also uh, totally recommend our YouTube channel. Uh, there's a lot of informative videos on there stuff like this that might inform you about something pertaining to uh, residential construction. Um, so yeah, yeah, totally check us out. Yeah. And thank you all for uh, coming in and joining us on this beautiful Wednesday afternoon. Uh, please stay tuned for our next webinar. It's going to be covering the three mastic sealant questions you're not asking. So again, we thank you for coming and we hope you have a wonderful day. Yep. Yep. Thank you all for joining. And thank you, James. You did a great job. Oh, thank you.